So my background is in running a small-scale farm. Uh, I used to run a, a one-acre mixed vegetable farm on Vancouver Island, which is just off the south coast of British Columbia in Canada. And it's a very typical model in BC, you know, mixed vegetables, sort of the farmer's market for CSAs, for restaurants. Um, had a farm stand, did a little bit of seed production as well, uh, really tried to diversify. It was my introduction to agriculture. I didn't have a lot of agriculture experience before running this farm, um, which is why it didn't do very well. Um, where was Curtis Stone 15 years ago, I tell you? Um, <laughs> And so, but I, I did learn a lot. Um, I guess two things I learned is what to do and what not to do. Uh, I learned them equally well. Um, I won't make the same joke about this slide that I made last time. Um, okay. So in the last, you can only recycle stuff so much. Um, so in my last year of doing mixed vegetables, um, I wanted to introduce something new to the farmer's market. And the farmer's market in Victoria where I went um, was, was a good market because all the farmers had really unique things. And if you go to a lot of farmers markets, it's like, this guy has beets, carrots, and, veg and you know, salad mix, and she's got the same thing. And it was a good market. And, and I thought, I did okay at the market, but not enough. And I want to in introduce some new products that could um, maybe bring some business that other people didn't have. And so years before, I had, I had grown sunflower sprouts on a, on a windowsill in, in my kitchen, and I thought, well, if I can grow one tray of those, I could probably grow 50 of them. And I, it was something I knew, would, I thought would be a good seller, and it wasn't at the market. Nobody I knew was growing them. And in fact, a lot of people, um, when I asked, asked other uh, vendors about it, they were hesitant to grow them because very much people thought of, of them as sprouts at the time, and that's something people avoided. So from a business perspective, what I had done is I, 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 I thought I had identified a niche crop that I could grow and bring to the farmer's market. So that's where I started developing this sort of, this idea. So that was the last year on that farm. I left Vancouver Island and moved to Vancouver to go to school. And I wanted to keep working on this model, basically. So I was able to do it as a directed studies project at UBC Farm and develop the model. And a big part of developing the model was to make a small-scale microgreens model that was done in accordance to Canadian Food Inspection Agency guidelines for sprouted seed production. So the CFIA in Canada would be the equivalent, basically, of the FDA in the US. And there's not regulations for sprouts, but there are guidelines. And so I thought, if I'm going to develop a model, I want to develop it within the context which it exists in our sort of regulatory environment, um, because I wanted my business to succeed, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So I knew that was something I would have to address eventually, so I wanted to start my model in that place, basically. So the first year, like my, my deliverable for that year was a production manual, which we still use and have just expanded it on, expanded on and, and sort of changed as we go. Um, we talked about this a bit yesterday. It was our standard operating procedures for everything we do. It was our sanitation plan. It was our seeding rates, all that. So I moved the, we, the farm moved from UBC Farm, which was really the pilot year, onto a private piece of land where expansion started. And a big part of expansion now is starting to work with jackasses. I mean, uh, other people in the neighborhood who are interested in food. Uh, so, so you know, once again, this was stuff that I'd sort of uh, thought about. If I'm going to grow the business, um, I, I can't do this on my own. I'm going to need to bring other people in. And so that's what the second and subsequent years were. We're basically building a crew, um, learning how to manage people as well. Um, Having run the farm on my own, I actually didn't have any management skills. I learned very quickly. So luckily, I was pleasant enough. Uh, so as, you know, so the next expansion for the business was, was basically trying to increase growth. So when we were just a, when we made the move and I had a crew, we were just producing in the summer, producing around thirty-five or forty thousand dollars worth of sprouts. And so the way to expand the business for us, the, the, the most logical way was to expand our season. So we could go from five months to 12 months. So, you know, we, we basically, I won't tell the whole story, but we, we, we bought a shipping container and turned it into a greenhouse. And so what this did was gave us sort of ultimate climate control. And that's the way in, in because we've got a fairly mild Mediterranean-like climate, um, you can do some pretty good outdoor production in BC over the winter, but there's no way I could produce microgreens on their own without any sort of help. So 
the reason for the shipping container, uh, there's a couple reasons, is while, while we were building the business for success, I was also building the business for failure. So the nice thing about a shipping container is we can just kind of pick it up, stick it on a truck, and drive it away, hopefully to another location. Um, and same thing with the, with the benches that we used in the beginning. We, we made them in four by eight sections, and at several points in, in production, we just added another section on, and boom, we could grow another 16 trays. So it was meant to be expanded. Expanding meant, you know, buying another bike trailer, buying another cooler, and some of that stuff we had already prepared and bought a lot of in the beginning. So really planning for that. Um, and that's sort of the, a summary. We've got the new greenhouse there. We've got the old benches, which we still use because it allows us to expand production, and then some of the bikes that we use for delivery. So what we're talking about here is growing in stages. So I, I've talked with a, with a lot of you already this weekend, and um, I guess we're just getting into the weekend this week, and uh, I get inquiries from all over the place and, and do consults, and I kind of get two different sort of perspectives on things. I, I get, um, and I'm picking on a few people in this room, I'm like, hey, I got this cool setup in my basement. And then we've got other folks who's like, hey, I bought a shipping container and a thousand trays and a bunch of seeds and I'm ready to go. And they're, they're kind of both ends of the spectrum. And I'm very much a grow in stages kind of guy. Uh, and there's sort of four things that I had identified that that did for me. Because at the time, I can't say I was as organized as I am now. So the four stages. I feel I should get into a, a motivational speech here. The four stages to happiness. <laughs> but I will not, because I don't know those four stages yet. Um, so one of the things is, with microgreens is, is getting to know your crops. So if I want to learn how to grow just about any vegetable, I can go to an intern on a farm anywhere in North America and learn a lot of that stuff. When I started this, it was really, really hard to find information on, on microgreens. There just wasn't people doing it. There was there's the small people like, hey, I sprout in jars. And then there was the big scale companies um, who just couldn't, sorry, I didn't mean to make fun of you if you sprout in jars, by the way. Uh, I sprout in jars. Um, and then there's the big scale companies, and they don't tend to share information. Um, the reality is now there's actually a, a lot of fairly decent information out there because of the advances in technology and the sharing people are scaling up microgreens production and, um, and sharing that on the internet. So it's a chance to get to know the crops. The nice thing about microgreens, which you would contrast with any vegetable crop, is I'm growing a crop every week. So I'm getting a chance to, to, to correct my mistakes very, very quickly. So technically, you should learn the trade fairly quickly. Um, but because they're very particular crops, there are a lot of things to, to sort of, it's a steep learning curve. So the next thing was, is developing your systems. So I talked about systems yesterday, and systems to me are about efficiency and, and getting on to the next task or getting on with your life. And it can take some time to develop them to a really efficient point. And, and for those of you who are running farms, you know in, in the beginning, you know, you're working long hours and long weeks and long, you know, you've got a long season. But as you get better and better at things, doing the same amount of work becomes a lot easier. So as you're scaling up, you have to be efficient in order to meet the demands and still have some sort of life. So that's a big part of it. The other thing, and this theme keeps coming up uh, at the conference, and I love it, it's, it's building relationships. I'm sorry, am I making it all blurry with the camera? Okay. <laughs> um, this was something I've probably only realized in the past two years, the value of this. And, and I think I talk about it a bit later. Um, I'm very task focused. I'm very much about getting shit done, as I, as I talked about yesterday. Um, and that's important. That'll always be important in terms of running a business. But the relationship piece is huge. And, and the reason is um, the relationships are long term. Tasks are immediate. And what we're learning is, is we're, get, we're now getting customers because we built a relationship three or four years ago. And we're getting customers. It's not the person I built the relationship is with. It's the person that they referred um, to us. So we're really finding that that's paid off in many, many ways, both with our customers and with our suppliers. So our suppliers really go out of their way to look for things that they don't have. So, so that's really made a, a big difference. And tied into that is, is building our reputation. So, you know, you might, you know, I'm going to pick on you, Scott, even though you're looking at your phone and not paying attention to my presentation at all. It's okay. <laughs> um, 
You know, so, so you, you grow a good crop, you, t you take it off to, to, the, uh, to a chef, they buy it, that's great, and then your next crop is good, and then your next crop completely fails, and you don't know why, and then you're like three or four weeks without a crop, and you don't know what to do. Um, and I have been in this situation, so I don't mean to just pick on Scott, but um, over time, when you're consistently delivering a good product, when you're consistently, you know, your customer service is good, your pricing is good, you're tolerable when you're around the chef, um, you get a reputation and then people want to work with you. So that's something that takes time um, and it takes longer periods of time with, with different folks. So um, if you have particular questions about the stuff we're talking about, go ahead and ask at any point. If it's something sort of over here, and we'll talk about it at the end. So if you, yeah, you can just shout stuff out if you want. Yeah, well, wait till the end, please. No, 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 go ahead, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So when you were speaking about the building reputation and, and starting off and your, your crops dying, you're inconsistent. Yeah. How did you, how, not just the, the skills portion of figuring out troubleshooting what you did wrong, but how did you return your customer's value when you, you know, stepped in? Um, so in the beginning, my main market was, uh, so, to repeat the question for the camera, um, how did I deal, basically the question is, you know, when I had these problems, how, how did I approach the customer to deal, basically deal with their loss that, that they would suffer? Um, so in the beginning, my market was the farmer's market. So it was my loss. If I don't show up at the farmer's market, nobody's menu is affected, right? Nobody's meal plan is really affected. People could get other stuff at the market, even though they couldn't get that particular product. Other failures I had, <laughs> when I had more restaurant customers, I knew well before harvest day that I wasn't getting a crop. Like I could tell you on day three of germination whether or not our crop was gonna be mature. So I would call folks up and say like, listen, we, we may not have a crop next week. Weather's been bad or I might have forgot to soak the seed, something like that. Chefs are like, great, thanks for letting me know. They can get this product elsewhere, they just can't get our product. So giving people as much notice as possible goes a long, long way, for sure, yeah. Okay, so I talked about this and I, I, I alluded to this w within, the, uh, within the beginning part. The whole time I, I'm developing the sy system, I'm developing it, developing it to be successful. So I'm not thinking about, you know, what kind of space do I have and how much can I grow in this space? It's like, how much space do I want to have and how much do I need to have a, a bigger business? So when I showed uh, the, the growing benches that we use, these were built intentionally to be built quickly, rather inexpensively, um, and I just add, like literally, it's just like adding an, a part onto that. And that worked really, really well for us, because literally it's like, we've got a few more orders, um, we're on a slightly longer crop cycle, so we need more space. And I remember once, like, like we'd finished our harvest, and I basically, you guys do deliveries, I ran home to, over to Home Depot, grabbed all the stuff, put the thing up, by the end of the day, we had another, this capacity for a whole bunch more trays. So it was really, really designed that way right from the beginning. And so if you're, if you're kind of looking at, um, a couple things you need to look at is your budget. How is that gonna change over time? You know, people often just see a tray and they see a tray equaling $20 and they do this math in their head. That's not really gonna, have, gonna be how it works out when, when things start to grow. Um, let's see what else I wanted to cover on that. Oh yeah, so same thing with the, with the greenhouse as well. So our shelving was designed, we can, we can raise the shelving so we can put another layer up there. Um, we can put shelving in between, a sort of an in-between layer. So we, ha we have a sense what the capacity is, but we, we, we had sort of stages to get there. So we didn't buy all our shelving at once. We didn't want to put all that money out because we knew we wouldn't use it all. So as, our, as it growed, we would add a piece of shelving, add a piece of shelving, add in-between shelving. So it allowed us to not spend all the money in the outset and sort of expand as we went. So this is important if you're, you know, I've had a few conversations. If your model is in your basement, you know, that's a great development model, but if you were successful, how long could it stay in your basement for? So it's either you find another, have another space that you can move into, or you basically collapse the business. If your business wants to grow and you don't let it grow, it'll probably collapse anyway. So it's a tricky space to be in. People often want to keep their business at about this level, some businesses that works for, for successful businesses it usually doesn't. Was it, is that down in the bottom right hand corner, is that supplementation light? Oh. Supplemental light or is that just how the sun's shining? Do you use supplemental light? 
We use, um, yep, so that's not, that's just, that's just been uncovered. So it's still, does it have any chlorophyll production? It's, I think it's wheatgrass there. So it's still yellow. Uh, yeah, we use high pressure sodium lights this time of year. It's not as nice in Vancouver as it is in San Diego. So yeah, basically from about um, mid-September through mid-April, we use supplementary light. Yeah. No, we do everything in soil. Yeah. No, nope, we heat the whole space. At the lot of heating pads, we, we priced that out and, and just, you know, cleaning and sanitizing that sort of stuff, we, we couldn't figure out how to do that, basically. Uh, high pressure sodium are high in the blue spectrum. So the other thing is these lights are, they run at 1,000 watts each. No, I mean high pressure sodium. Metal, metal halide are high in the red spectrum. And so red spectrum causes a lot more stretching. It actually makes sprouts look really ugly. Um, so yeah, so high in the blue. I'm, either that or I'm, I'm mixing it up in my head right now, but yeah. Um, the other thing with these lights, so a lot of people in this sort of system would use fluorescence. These lights give off more heat than light. So we, we are actually capturing that heat, we want it, whereas in most systems you're trying to get it out. So yeah. And the same thing with like with the heat mats, with the fluorescence, having to run lights on every shelf in there, just as it's a pain, basically. Yeah, yeah, there's basically, th we've got three units, could probably use four, and it actually does hit most of both of the three shelves. We just rotate the crops once a day on the bottom to make sure that that back part gets enough light, yeah. Weren't you listening yesterday? Sorry, <laughs> right, sorry. Right. I think I covered that yesterday. Um, okay, so all that said about um, making fun of people uh, growing sprouts in their basements, this was my living room one uh, winter when I'd gone to Terra Madre in, in, in Italy and came back all inspired and also unemployed. I'm like, oh, what am I going to do for work? And I'm like, well, I've got a product and I've got a customer base. So I called up all my restaurants and I said, well, I'm going to produce sunflower sprouts this winter. Do you want to buy them? I'm like, yeah. So I think I could do 18 trays uh, and I did one harvest a week. And from my living room, I, I, I basically did $700 in sales. And so <laughs> the way it works out is, you can follow me with the camera here. Um, this is where I store all like the trays and the soil and all the equipment. And this is where I stored my kids' toys. <laughs> so the, the thing with these systems is, um, and I was talking to someone the other day, what do I do when I'm making a delivery at a restaurant or I'm at the farmer's market and the health inspector says, I'd like to come inspect your facility. It's like, I'm sorry, that's not an option. Um, it has to be an option. So, uh, and someone else I was talking to, you know, people said, oh, can, I, can I come see where you grow? And this person's growing in their basement. It's like, well, no, you can't come to my house, basically. So, so there is that whole thing. And I think about that a lot now. I hadn't thought about it a lot later, but one of our ways of attracting customers is getting them to our site and seeing what we do. That goes a long way. So. So yeah, if you have cats, if you have kids, if you have pets, if you have a neighbor downstairs, oh my God, I was a very hated man for a very long time um, because of how much noise actually just doing this activity all the time made. So this was actually a bit of a pilot to see what could we do indoors and, and it, it paid off because it's what led to us doing the container. But as a long-term thing, this isn't, this isn't an option. So keep that in mind. So here and then there. No, well, this was, uh, so the question was, did I have any trouble with health inspectors because of this type of setup? Well, no, because they didn't know about it. But if a health inspector did, I I'd be screwed. Like, not only would this get, sh so I, I did get shut down. My landlady, the, the woman downstairs called my landlady and said, something's going on up there. So, and something was going on up there. Like, I had, like, sales charts on the wall, and I had a hose running from the bathroom. It was pretty awesome, actually. It really was. Um, I'm washing trays in the bathtub, and, but I'm sanitizing everything, and I got my gloves on. So, for what it was, it was okay. But the health inspector, no way. So, not only would this have shut this down, but it, it would have ruined my reputation with the health inspector, like any relationship I would have had, and even getting into a legitimate business, we would have been red flagged. So yeah, in, in essence, if you're really trying to build a bigger business, it's a risk, so. You said that, obviously, you had your, your living room. So you were doing 18 trees at 700 bucks a week? Is that what you were, was that your? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and I can't remember what it was. I might, I might have been doing two harvests a week, actually. I can't remember what it was, so yeah. But it was pretty good money for my living room, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> you were saying that if the, you have ruined your reputation with health inspectors. Yes. Do you have a relationship with the health inspectors department now? Have they been out of your facilities now? So, next slide. So, so there's two. There's the, there's the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is a federal regulator, and then there's our municipal health inspector. Let me, I think I, I deal with both of these. Oh, no. I, I, um, we'll come to that. Can we do that? Yes. The question was, <laughs> well, he's going to ask it again. So if you're wondering, I'm supposed to repeat the questions for the camera. So this is, this is what I call, um, I just throw this in here in the middle here. This is what's called the reality check slide. Because um, I've been this guy, and some of you might be this guy or girl, um, that's like, okay, I can sell a tray of microgreens to these local restaurants for like 20, 25 bucks. I take the tray there, it's like 20 trays, and I, or 20 bucks a tray, I'm going to do 100 trays a week, that's $2,000, and they're doing this math. They're doing one side of the math, and there's this sort of, you know, uh, there's an extent to where that starts to fail. Because in the beginning, you know, if you've got a basic setup and you're just delivering a few trays to folks, you know, Soil and seeds are your main costs. And I think for us to do a tray of sunflower shoots, it's about $1.88 a tray. So that's what, $18.12 profit? That's not bad. But as your business starts to grow, you start taking on all these other expenses that somehow there's a big blind spot in there when, when you're developing this. Um, and these are things like, these are the stuff that comes up here are just sort of the inevitable things. And some of them are quite big costs that if you're growing food to, for sale to the public, you can't avoid, like insurance, like sanitizer, like, oh, we've got way more seeds in that, and now we, we need a place to store them. Our space is bigger, so we're paying, paying rent. We're doing more electricity. This was a big one for us. We had to pay to bank. We pay like $20 or $30 a month in banking fees. We couldn't pay cash anymore. We had to move to payroll. So we're paying employment insurance and workers' compensation. And, you know, so then maybe the inspector comes by and wants you to start testing your product. And then you got to get a bookkeeper and then software, like the software we use. And you're training folks. So if this doesn't have you turned off microgreens, I don't know what will. But these are just the realities of business. So when they say it costs money to make money, it's not like you're spending money and investing it. There's, these are the expenses that go in, and this doesn't include your capital expenditures like coolers and you know, fridges and freezers and, and, and the equipment you're going to buy. These are just the ongoing costs for the product. So keep that in mind as, as you're developing things. Um, either, grow, either grow for yourself and do something maybe for you and your neighbors, or be prepared to, to grow into this as your business grows. I assume if you want to grow, do microgreens as a business, you want it to be a successful business, and this is stuff that's going to come up. Or maybe not. OK. OK, so local regulations is, is the next bit here. So year five of our production, I get a phone call. It's Ray from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency who says, we would like to come and visit your facility. And I'm like, like we've, we've been waiting for that day, and, and one of my co-op partners is, oh, we should just call them and ask them to come and just do it proactively. And I'm like, no, we should not do that. It's going to happen one day anyways, and I'm not avoiding it. Um, but going back to planning for success, our whole model was built on the inspector coming to see it. So anyways, he said, we'll give a date. And we will basically, you know, we'll come and we'll do this. We're, we're doing some community outreach to microgreens growers um, to educate them on the, the standards. And there's a couple things that we have to adhere to. So he comes in. He's an experienced inspector, and he's got his apprentice with him. And the apprentices are always the eager ones. She just wanted to break us. It was a bit unnerving, actually. Um, and so we spend the next month cleaning everything top to bottom, organizing everything at right angles on the shelves, putting fresh wood chips down, you know, putting the proper, you know, rodent traps in the greenhouse, getting all our records in order. And then they come, and they, oh, there's supposed to be some pictures here. Okay. Um, it's different without the remote. Um, and then they come, and he pops his head in the greenhouse. Oh, it looks pretty good in here. And he pops his head in the harvest area and looks pretty good in here. We spend an hour and a half standing at a table. I'm like, what? And what he wants to see more than anything is our standard operating procedures, 
and our documentation showing we've done our sanitizing. So the example I gave um, the other day was, you know, when you're in a movie theater and you look, you're leaving the washroom, there's that chart on the back of the door that says time and date and staff signature, and there's this random scribble there. But this is their, your accountability chart, basically. And that was the thing that they really, really wanted to see. Now, we had some of that, but we didn't have a lot of it, actually. But what was good is we, you know, he's like, well, you know, and he asks the question because he, and he knows the answer. He's like, so do you have the standing o standard operating procedure manual? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's right here. It's like, oh. He's like, and what about your pest control? Oh, yeah, it's here, and we're flipping through the pages, and we're flipping through, a and it really diffused things because he found a number of what we would call minor errors. Oh, no, there was two major ones, actually, um, um, but a lot of minor stuff. But because we had some very, very important stuff done, he could see we were taking things very seriously, so there was no big sort of like, you guys got to get your shit together. Um, I can't remember what one of the major things was, but one of them was simply we didn't have protective covers on our lights. So if that light smashes, what's going to happen? It's going to get all over the crop, and then the crop is contaminated. Now our policy for that we, we did have was like, if a light breaks, this is all garbage. You know, if, if we send a batch to be tested and it comes back positive for something, like we're supposed to show how the batches are separated, we can't do that. We would destroy everything. But they, you know, they, they don't want to, you to have that sort of, we're destroy everything to deal with contamination. It's not a great policy. It's not very uh, economical. So yeah, we, we bought covers for the lights. We did it for our fluorescent lights that we had at the time. We just put these tubes over them. And then for the, our high pressure sodium, we just encased them in, a, in a, something you would use if you, were, if you were growing a different crop in BC and you needed to get the heat out of the system. So they were upgrades to our system, actually. There was a cost to it, but it made our system better. So we had planned for that, right? So we planned for knowing our local regulations. We built the system around that. So these are the things you need to consider. Now going back to the basement. Imagine it's in your basement. The, the inspector does come. And you could say, yeah, it's in my basement, but there's my hand washing station. And yeah, here's my protocol sheets here. And, and here's all my sanitation records. You know, so the, the health inspector might come in and go, you can't have this in your basement. But considering it's in your basement, you've kind of got your bases covered. So if you're going to do something that's breaking the rules, I know the permaculture crowd likes to break the rules, um, know what the rules are. So as an example, in our, um, I mean, there's more pictures here. I want that remote back. Ugh. Mine ran out of batteries. I just left it at home. Um, so as an example, because what I don't like is getting caught on stuff you're not talking about. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency guidelines uh, talk about sanitizing your seed and the proportion of sanitizer to seed. I think it was five to one in the standard. And I'm like, yeah, we don't use five to one, we use two to one. He's like, well, why? I'm like, ah, well, there's no documented proof showing five to one does a better job and it just uses way more sanitizer. So we use two to one, it works pretty well, we've still got a good proportion and that way we're not using more chemical and he's like, yeah, okay, makes sense. So once again, they're guidelines. So if you're going to break the guidelines, know what they are so you can speak to it. And then you can just do anything you want, really. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's another picture of clean stuff. So, you know, lots of stainless steel. We try to do all that sort of thing. Um, one of the things was, you know, um, we needed a hand wash station at the, at the farmer's market. And so I'm talking about this like the health inspector says something. I'm like, okay. Like the health inspector comes to the market and tells us we need a hand wash station. I'm like, oh, jeez. Why, why don't they just leave us alone? And then I calm down and I do my breathing exercises and count to 10. It's like, okay, we'll just put in a hand wash station. The challenge for us is always, we were taking everything to market on a bike. Now we need to carry 25 pounds in water with us. Now we need to carry, so this stuff logistically becomes a very big challenge. So anyways, we figure that out. We just drive it to the market now, so, with a bike trailer. It's deceptive, I know, but. Um, <laughs> You do it again, okay. So this is a bit of a, any questions there? Is that, did it get all stressful at first for you basement growers? Then you're like, okay, I can do this, I can do this. <laughs> Good, and did that answer your question? Yeah, well, there, there was one other part of that question. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell the camera the question this time. Good. Okay. Does the health inspector that you deal with now know what you were doing in the past, or are they oblivious? Okay, so the question is, yeah, yeah. So the, the question is, did the health inspector that inspected us now know what happened in the past? So in the CFIA case, yes, they had our previous report. 
so they could look at our previous report, take a look at that. How did you guys deal with previous year's things? Let's look at things and then see what, what's, what's to look at for next year. But for the market health inspectors, no. I don't think they even know there's other health inspectors that work in the same field with them, even though they all work in the same office. So inspector one comes one day and says, oh, I'm going to test your sanitation bottle here. Oh, it's 100 parts, or it's 200 parts per million. Our book says it's 100, should be 100 parts per million. And I'm like, well, our book says 200, but okay. And then the next week, or a couple weeks later, another inspector comes and says, 200 parts per million, okay, good. And then one person says, you can't put your wheatgrass like that. And another person says, oh, I like what you've done with the wheatgrass. So there's no communication there. And that actually gets very, very, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit, oh my God. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge because it puts you in the situation of, you know, do I always try and meet this super high standard or do I just do nothing, right? And, and we like to respond to that feedback if we think it's going to make us a better operation. But to do stuff just, you know, to satisfy somebody, and it's happened we've changed something and someone will say, oh, why do you do this? And then we'll say, well, because the other health inspector told us to do it. And they say, really? Why would they tell you to do that? I'm like, so... These are things. So the CFIA one was a little better. He had our report. He followed up on the report. Great. You know, that makes a lot of sense to me. But every, every inspector coming in with a different sort of attitude and a different sort of level of authority or, or that, that doesn't make sense. So that may be different in other places, but that's how it is in Vancouver. Yeah. All right. Anything else there? I noticed on your, on your wagon that you, are you cutting the greens right as somebody wants them? Is that how that works in that model? So... Um, Generally, no, we, we pre-cut, we put them in totes, and then we package to order. That way people can kind of mix and match. Um, but we will cut um, wheatgrass and juice it there at the market, yeah. So. What juice it? Uh, the tornado. Stainless steel juicer, thinking to survive the apocalypse. Yeah. All right, let's go on here. Um, okay, so this is a bit, of, a bit of a turn. So our next thing here is... Um, Always attracting new customers. Now, generally you're marketing, trying to do a decent amount of marketing all the time. But one thing you need to remember with microgreens is they're a really niche crop, you know? And they're, they're generally pretty, they, they don't tend to stay on menus for very long. If you're working with a lot of high-end restaurants, they like to change the menu, they like to mix things up. So, you know, we'll have big orders from a restaurant for a while, and they're like, yeah, we changed the menu, we're done. You know, or, you know, it's like, we, we've got a new chef, this is a good one, we've got a new chef coming in, you know, they don't want your product anymore, or it's something. So that change happens a lot with microgreens. Um, with, with a lot of vegetable crops, there may be some seasonality, but I noticed before it was fairly consistent. So this changes a lot. Um, so yeah, we work, um, we're, we're always trying to approach all our types of customers. So one of the things I talk about is, because we have a lack of diversity in crops, we try to have a, a di diverse range of customers. And some of them are, are pretty obvious, like a raw vegan cafe, and we grow sprouts. Yeah, totally. It's amazing how many of them don't want our stuff, actually. It kind of bugs me. Um, uh, we, we, we are hitting restaurants a lot. We're always soliciting restaurants, checking menus. Anytime I see uh, sprouts on a menu that we grow, I, I email the, uh, the restaurant and I mock them for not buying our stuff, actually. Um, because it means they're, they're carrying a lesser product than they actually could. And, and I do kind of mock them in a very diplomatic and friendly kind of way. And it kind of works, to be honest. Sometimes I'm sending these emails off, I'm like, I ah, send. <laughs> and and it's, it, it, it's paid off a number of times, and then there's a lot of no responses. And so I don't know what's going on on the other end there, but I'll just pretend they didn't get that one. So did you have a question? Right. So the question is, do I feel it's a lesser product because it's shipped from somewhere else or because uh, our product is superior? Of course I feel our product is superior. Um, I'm totally arrogant about our product um, because it is superior, because we, we're growing it and delivering it fresh. So I know if anything's being shipped in, it's two to three days old and probably two th through two distributors by the time it gets to that restaurant. Um, and I also know, based on a lot of experience now, that our product keeps longer than anything anybody else is producing. So that has a lot of value to chefs. And if there's anything that we work on to make sure happens all the time, it's that our product is storable. So we, we had a chef come in recently, 
And he said, like, you know, what do you do your pea shoots for? I said, well, we do them for 15 bucks a pound. He's like, oh, that's a really good price. We're paying 22 bucks a pound right now. And they start going off within three days. And I'm like, these things start going off within a week. I'll, re you know, I'll replace the full order. Like, it, it's, it's not even a question. So it takes that right off the plate. And actually, these guys started buying our, our, our product a couple weeks ago. And they're like, we're going to take four pounds twice a week, which is, which is a good order for what we're doing. And already they're down to two pounds. He's like, yeah, they're just, you know, they're not spoiling. I'm like, oh, okay, so this isn't really working so well for us. But, you know, what, what are the, lowers, the order now is going to be lower, but we've got a loyal customer now because of that, right? So what I often do is I look for where our competition is on the menu and I approach those menus, those uh, chefs particular, specifically. So, so yeah, so we're big onto that quality piece. So yeah, I do think our stuff is superior. Uh, and you should too, actually. If you're not growing a superior product, then, then keep working on it because that's what chefs want. They really do. Okay, so these are just some of the other, you know, so we're selling to grocers. Choices is a, is, a, is a market chain in BC that we sell to, and that's made a big difference for us. And then this is like a little, um, a little Portuguese uh, family-owned restaurant just a few blocks from where we produce, and we've been selling to them for years, and they're now a pickup point for our pickup customers for us, um, and they're carrying our wheatgrass trays, and we, I've probably spent $25,000 in, in over many years eating lunch there, so I actually feel I partially own that place. Um, and they make the best chorizo sausage. Um, okay, now there is this little disclaimer. Uh, you need to be prepared. This is sort of like, you know that dirty little secret about certain things? I'm about to tell you the dirty little secret about being a microgreens grower. I'm, I'm really kind of pissed it's on camera. Um, your core customer base is crazy people. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, is, this is a problem. No, so this crazy person is actually my child, so that's okay. Um, but we deal with um, some of the strangest people you can imagine. I just went to this awesome health institute, and all they talked about was wheatgrass, and I want to get your wheatgrass, and this is my dog, and this is a beautiful sweater, and I teach a yoga class, and it's... It's nice in a way because you know, it's, it's great that people are coming to us for our products, but it's really intense. And we actually had to change our whole, um, we used to have people come pick up from us. And we loved it because they'd come and we could chat and they could see our operation, but they would come and they would chat and they would talk and talk and we're trying to work. And so we're like, we can't do this anymore. So we, we were able to form this relationship with, with this, this company where we had been selling for a long time. But because people, would, they, and they wouldn't be talking about sprouts, they'd be talking about all sorts of things and politics and what their kid is doing. And, ah, so it, it's an interesting crowd. It really is. They're very health focused, but they have this whole different lifestyle. And it's, um, I feel bad making fun because they're actually great people. But <laughs> um, you've got to be ready for that. Like, we didn't really have a sense, and we're talking one day, we're like, who is our core market? And there are people often with a very alternative lifestyle, with a very different perspective on life. Not that you people can relate to that. Um, but yeah, there's, there, there are a few people who maybe take it a bit far. So anyways, that said, <laughs> you should focus on relationships. And um, so once again, this, this, theme, this theme's coming up, and I do, like, I, I'm the guy who sits there smiling, like, I want to shoot myself. But I, I think it's worth that time, right? It, it's a little tricky when we do, we do have a lot of deadlines in our production, and it's, but it's worth spending the time with the customer. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you want to maintain that relationship, and so you do it. So now what I've started doing is I just, as soon as I start talking, I don't stop. Oh, we sowed the sunflower, and then we just did these different seeding densities, and seeding density is so intriguing, and sometimes they come up this tall, and sometimes they're off like this, but the peas, they're totally different, and yeah, kind of, then they come, and they just pick up their bags, and they go. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, and you know how it feels, so, so I, have some, I have some crazy person in me, too. God, I hope none of our customers see this presentation. Um, okay, so... Relationships, like I said earlier, it's been, it's been a big theme um, at this conference, uh, and it's actually been a big thing. As, as I mentioned, a couple of years ago, I really started changing my focus from um, really being task-oriented and goal-oriented and outcome-oriented, and really started looking at relationships. And 
You know what did it, and, I, and I'm so ashamed to say this, and now I have to admit this on camera as well, is it was a Facebook post. And it wasn't just a Facebook post, it was a sponsored Facebook post. It was an advertisement that said, focus on relationships, not transactions. And I look at this thing, I'm like, God, I hate Facebook advertising. <laughs> what is this crap? But it, it kind of stuck with me, and then I saw it again, and then I saw it again, and I'm like, well, what does that mean? And why am I so sort of triggered by that? Um, and it's because I'm very task-oriented. Get shit done. And it's because what works. And what I realized, the example I gave myself about how I was focused on transactions was I'd send an email to somebody, hey, can you help me out with this? They might send an email back verifying a few things. I'm like, yeah, that's it. They're like, yes, we can help you, or no, we can't help you. And I drop the conversation. I got what I want, and I move on to the next thing. And I'm like, oh, well, there wasn't really a lot of chance to build relationship there. I got what I wanted, and then I jumped ship. And so I started shifting the way I did things. And, and I'm actually, I'm using this technique here on you all right now. So what, when I'm talking to people here, like, I'm not trying to get anything from anybody. I'm just trying to build a relationship kind of with this idea in mind that I'll get something someday, but I'm going to be giving during that whole time as well. And it's a really different um, approach that is really easy. And, and now I'm just, ma I, make, I make way more friends. We have way better relationships with our customers. Things aren't so stressed because they're not, it's not all about, um, it's not all about the transaction. When I go in and do a delivery with a chef, we don't talk about sprouts. We talk about our kids. We talk about Snowboarding, we talk about, well, we talk about the weather. Um, so it, it's very different perspective. So what we're doing is we're relating to each other as people. We're not relating to each other in the roles we have as, as, a, as a producer and as a, as a buyer. So that, that's a big thing. Um, here's some of the people we have relationships with. Jesse at Heirloom. Now, I'm a little pissed at Jesse at the moment, actually. Um, but we have a good relationship, and I'm empathetic, so that's okay. Um, so a lot of, we have a lot of good relationships, and the thing with, actually, Jesse's a really good example about um, relationships. Heirloom Restaurant is about the fifth restaurant we've worked with Jesse at. So Jesse just kind of leaves this trail of, you know, Jesse will work somewhere, we'll sell there, we'll often keep selling when he moves on, we'll follow him to the next place and move on. This place turned out to be a gong show, um, which might have been Jesse's fault. Um, but yeah, so what we're always doing that. So, you know, when chefs move along, it's actually a good thing for us because it allows us to open up some more markets. Do you have a question there, Wes? Do you see, you know, chefs moving around here, do you see a lot of, you know, retained business Totally. And, and actually, uh, so the question, actually, can you repeat the question? Make it concise so I can repeat. Yeah, so the question is, with chefs moving around a lot, do we retain the business in the old restaurant and, and move with the chef uh, to the new restaurant? So often, yes, that's the case. Now, what happens when a new chef comes in? What does a new chef do? Pisses all over everything. He wants to mark his territory, or she wants to mark her territory. A lot of female chefs in Vancouver, right? So, like, sprouts on the menu. I don't, I don't work with sprouts. I'm going to bring in and dive. You know, so there's often a lot of change when, when chefs change because they want to make their mark. Um, but what we'll often do is, so that's fine, menus change, and then six months later we're like, hey, how's your menu looking? We used to sell to so-and-so, you know, we've been selling for years to that person, and so we'll get in there at another point, basically, and that works fairly well, yeah. Um, I had another... So the question is, you know, do we ever do custom growing? I remembered this time. Uh, custom growing for chefs, if they come in and make requests, will we grow it for them? So the short answer for that is no. Um, growing a new crop, uh, it takes time. It takes time to get a new crop in our system, and our system is very, very intensive. Uh, we're pushing things on a very, very quick cycle, so a lot of crops can't handle that. So often we'll say, well, what's the crop? And we'll tell them yes or no right away. Uh, and then what we might do is we'll trial it a little bit. And if it works and, and we can integrate it into our system, we'll do it. Most of the time, it doesn't work. So we're, we're playing with cilantro right now. And what we're finding, we're getting a pretty good crop, but it doesn't yield well enough. And, and our model isn't built on dainty little microgreens like a lot of companies are. Like we, we grow big, hearty ones. We want, want, want to sell big quantities. We want to make it more widely available at a better price. When we start growing those little ones, like the price just goes way, way up. Um, and it's not the, really the model we want. So yeah, we haven't really had too many of those work out. So. 
it's a good model, and I think a lot of chefs like that because they'll they'll contract to vegetable growers all the time. You know, they're like, I got these beans from my grandmother's garden. Can you guys grow them out for me? And 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 farmers will do it. But yeah, we don't. We haven't really had success with that yet. So maybe cilantro, but the cilantro was for Jesse, and Jesse's not an heirloom anymore. So I'm not sure what we're gonna do with it. So, um, and yeah, so we've got. Um, you know, good grocer relations as well. This is an, a new grocer that opened up on, on Main Street in, in Vancouver. And as soon as somebody new opens up, that's what we're always looking for. Who are the new restaurants? Um, you know, who are the new grocers? Getting in early, because we're kind of saying like, hey, we've got some brand recognition. Let us come in and kind of help you along. And, and people do. They come in, it's like, oh, hey, you guys have food peddler sprouts. So if we can get in early, I think it, it kind of is mutually beneficial. And once again, we're, we're sort of building some relationships there. Um, so restaurants, grocers are good. The best place for building relationships is at the farmer's market. So we had a campaign last winter. It was called the Shot Face Campaign. So we sell wheatgrass at the market. And anybody had wheatgrass here? Yeah, yeah great stuff, eh? These are some of the different faces we got from uh, our crazy customers at the market as they're drinking <laughs> wheatgrass. So actually, it was, she was the one who came up with it. So you know, we, we try to do things to keep people engaged. So this is Ross, one of my co-op partners. I personally can't stand wheatgrass, so I, I'm right up there with that. So, um, so yeah, we're always trying to, like, ever since I sort of came on that, I'm really, really trying to push that and always find ways, like, how can we engage with people in a way that's not just about, here's your sprouts, give us your money, have a nice day. So, yeah, really focusing on that. Questions there? Yeah, good. Um, okay, now I'm going to go off in another direction as well. Technology. So, like... I'm pretty sure everybody's got a supercomputer in their pocket right now that you're using. Uh, I'm not going to go over the um, stuff that everybody uses. I mean, everybody's probably using Google. I've got the implant, which is just easier. Um, you know, email, stuff like that. But there's a few specific tools that we've used that, that really seem to work really well for microgreens. Um, so one kind of weird one was, so when we were designing the shipping container, we did the original stuff on SketchUp. So it really gave us a sense of the reality of what we were looking at, gave us a, a way to look at a few different designs, and that way we didn't have to pay you know, an engineer, an, ar an architect, tens of thousands of dollars just to get an idea of the concept we wanted. And it really gave us a sense of what we could and couldn't do. It actually told us um, we mapped out our whole site, had it set exactly to where um, the sun is, and we could use the program to see where the shadows would fall with different shelver, shelving arrangements. So it gave us a lot of information. So it was a particularly good tool. Um, so in the greenhouse itself, we use a lot of what is fairly basic technology, but very effective technology. So we've got uh, you know, a thermostat like everybody does, but we can control it from, from somewhere else via Wi-Fi. We've got an attic fan that comes on when it gets to a certain temperature. So we, can, um, so we can take heat out. We've got a carbon monoxide uh, monitor. Uh, we've got a, a data logger, so we know, you know every five minutes the, the temperature and humidity is logged, so we can take a look at our data, and we can correlate our growth to our, to our, to our data in that way. So there's a lot of information we can get. Um, in our harvest area, we've often got our laptop set up there, so we've got our order list, and we've got our, we've got our spreadsheet up there. So if things change, remember that really bad slide I had up yesterday of the spreadsheet? That's it right there. <laughs> it's the orange that stands out there. Um, so we can update that as people are, are, uh, are, are engaging with us and picking up orders, so we've got that up to date all the time. So just as I mentioned, orders are changing all the time, and we're always trying to sew to order. We don't want to grow trays that we can't sell. So we're, always, we're like up to the minute. We always want to know where things are at. So as soon as we get an order change, actually, I'm going to skip the next one and go to, as soon as we get an order change, we put it on our to-do list. So we use Wonderlist as our, our sort of to-do list. Anything comes up that has to happen, we put it there. So the reason is, uh, when I put it up there, everybody on our team sees it. Everybody gets a notice. So. When I put up, you know, traffic needs two pounds of pea for Friday, you know, they know, okay, well, traffic usually gets four pounds, now they're getting two pounds. So when, when it goes to packing, they know to make that change. And then one of us makes that change in the spreadsheet, clicks it off the box, everybody gets a message that it's done. So it's a way for all of us to know what the other people are doing. This one here is our general to-do list. It goes way down the screen there. Um, and it's just, it's often the reminder of like, what is the stuff we're up to? 
we had a meeting, you know, Jamie's going to write our job description, Ross is going to follow up on the website stuff, Chris is going to go off to a conference in San Diego while we work. Um, so yeah, it, it's a good tool, and what it does is we're actually looking through that all the time. Oh, when did that happen? Um, you know, so it gives us a record of, of tasks we've done, and that actually makes a big difference for us over time when we go back to think, you know, when did we do that, or when did that person call? Um, going back a little, I want to go back to this last slide. Um, last year, we issued 2,500 invoices. So up until then, we had done everything with those little paper ones, and then tried to have a system to mark who had paid and who hadn't. You can't do that. I don't know how it's done. Um, so we moved to uh, mobile invoicing. So we actually do all our invoicing. So we'll do our delivery, or we'll do our harvest. We'll get everything ready. And then we'll all basically do all the invoices up for the route we're going to do, and we've got everything on our phone. When we go to make the delivery, um, the customer either pays or signs. They sign right on the phone. We save that. We send it off to them. They've got their invoice right away. We've got it logged into, into our, our uh, it's basically on the cloud, and that keeps track of all our, uh, you know, who owes, who's paid, what are customers buying. We can, we can run a lot of reports on that as well, and it gives us a whole bunch of information all in one, one spot. Don't use invoice to go if you're going to use one. It's the best user interface, but we have never had so much trouble with a piece of software in our lives. I don't know what the alternative is yet. We're kind of stuck with this one. Um, but I highly recommend electronic invoicing because it makes a lot of sense in a, in a lot of ways, especially when you're dealing with that many invoices. And that was the thing for us. The volume was just too much to keep up with. Did I see hands? No? So you don't recommend the invoice? No, no, no. So the question is, I don't in recommend invoice to go. I'm happy to say on camera a third time, I do not recommend invoice to go. <laughs> Yeah, so there are some other ones out there, and, and the user interface is great, and, 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 the, and the features they have are incredible, but the, it doesn't work. The coding is all, it, the development is bad. So I sent an invoice to somebody the other day, and they're like, oh, it says we have a $2,400 credit. And so when I, when I had closed off a bunch of bills, it for some reason applied them all to one invoice. Like, there's all these little things that happen all the time which you know, seem like trivial things, but when you're sending invoices and statements out to people and they're coming back with this weird stuff like you know, the, the, the text is all garbled or it came through black or, and it's just so riddled with, with problems that it ends up being this, we have this whole other system for our invoicing, which is a double and a triple check on everything we do with that software. So it's made things easier in one way, but it's created this whole other list of tasks to manage its inadequacies. So we want to switch over to something else, but that change is another big change. It's getting to know another piece of software's problems, and so we're not quite ready for that yet. So um, there, then there, then Drew. What's the name of the software that you use for task management? Wonderlist. One, uh, what was the project management or the task management software? It's called Wonderlist with a U. Uh, and it's, it's great, actually. It's, it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, and I use it for everything. If you've, if you've told me something at this conference that I need to do later, it's already in Wonderlist because it's gone. It's not in my head anymore. So, so between Google and Wonderlist, I don't even have a memory anymore. It's great. <laughs> yeah, and even sends me reminders. So um, you had a question there? Have you lost customers because of your invoice issues? I don't. Have we lost customers because of our invoice issues? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I, we're probably just not as well respected. Um, but I always blame the invoice company, so, yeah. I was just going to recommend QuickBooks as a good alternative, or Square, you can send invoices as well. The trick is how, so the, some recommendation for QuickBooks and Square, um, it's got to be mobile friendly. We looked at, we were looking at the QuickBook ones, we're not quite ready for that one yet, so. Square you can do from mobile, but you want to punch everything in. Yeah, and can it take a signature? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we'll take a look, yeah. There's more and more coming on, like we've been using the, these guys, and we're always checking, let's check what's out there now. Let's check what's out there now. So yeah, it's, it's an ongoing thing. So I'm just noting we've got about five minutes, so yeah, another, and we're close to the end here. So. No, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Okay, good to know. Good. I'm just going to make a note here in Wonderlist. <laughs> no, my, it's not that bad. Actually, yeah, remind me about that later. Um, so I think that's that one. What else we got here? Oh, yeah, so this was one that I mentioned the other day. So the, another one we use, and I use this for a lot of different things, is Google Forms. 
So when I said we need to, we need to document everything for the inspector, we don't have clipboards up all over the place because they're just, they're unsightly. We do everything on our phone. So for logging our, um, logging our um, temperatures on our fridges, when we do sanitation in the greenhouse, when we're sowing and what that is, it's just a quick form. You check your name, the crop, the number, uh, you know, what it is. It logs the time and date automatically. And so instead of pulling out a sheet of signatures, we just pull out a, a database of stuff and it logs it a lot easier. Um, so it make, that makes it a lot, more, um, a lot more feasible. So all that said, and I talked about systems quite a bit yesterday, um, and I know you hear about systems a lot. What we've also really learned is you can't replace, um, no system replaces good communication. So we use all these tools, but we've got this redundancy, and, and I know permaculture is big on redundancies, we talk about them all the time. So I'll put something in Wonderlist, and then I'll say to Ross, my co-op partner, did you see that I put that in Wonderlist? Like, I, I kind of know he's seen it, but he's like, yeah. Oh, and I have a question. And it leads to these other things. And so it's this really, really good redundancy we've got that, that's working really well for us right now. And I say that because we had some people in the co-op before who didn't communicate well, and that saw a lot of problems. And that's probably where we lost some customers that didn't know about it. Things weren't getting communicated to us for two or three weeks. So we just had, like at the farmer's market, we have someone who picks up some bags at the farmer's market. And, and, and I come to the, the, the site on, on Monday and they're in the fridge. I'm like, well, how can this be? So I call her up and ask her and she's like, oh, well, you know, the guy forgot them, and, you know, so he just packed me fresh bags there. But there was no communication that that had happened. So there's all this unknown until that communication happens. And we've got a, a really good system right now. There's a, you know, there's a communication. This is, the, this is the look joyous. I'm going to take a picture for a presentation slide. Um, there's another slide where they're just sort of scowling at me, which is the general work environment. Um, but I, I took that one out. Um, it really goes a long way, and it's kind of like the phone call versus the text message or the email. Things happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. You know, so emails like, do you have this? Yes, great, see you then. But when you're do having those conversations in person, it can go off elsewhere and, and other things can happen. So that's what we're really, really learning. We need to communicate certain things um, using our systems, but by actually having some physical communication, we can take it a step further. So. So yeah, we've got two and a half minutes. Uh, we can ask some more questions, and then uh, Jean-Martin is in here afterwards. So anything specific about what we talked about or sort of random stuff about life and philosophy and counseling, I do offer that service, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, you should talk to your dad about that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, so first question, are we building our own soil? No, we have it pre-mixed for us. So I worked with the company, uh, you know, they, they do a lot of different horticulture and greenhouse and nursery soils. Called them up, asked them about their mixes. Uh, what's the common characteristic about a greenhouse and nursery soil? Uh, chemicals. They're all, they all, it's all just assumed. So he's like, oh yeah, and then it's got, so we're talking for like 45 minutes and he's like, and I guess you're going to need the iron magnesium uh, nitrogen mix. I'm like, whoa, no. Like, what do we need that for? It's like, oh, it's just standard. I'm like, no, no, no. So we've got a, a, a peat perlite uh, compost mix with, with lime in it. And we've only got about 5% compost in it. So it actually took us a while to get to that formulation based on the type of peat. Actually, we put a bit of coir in there, which is coconut fiber, and then the, the electrical conductivity of the soil, so how rich the, so the, or the compost was. So if you've got a very, very rich compost, you actually want less of it in there. So that's a whole other thing. You'll have to come to the workshop on Sunday for that. Um, and what was the other question? Are you bringing CO2 into the greenhouse? Yeah, so are we bringing CO2 into the greenhouse? No. So we, we, can, we bring in fresh air a lot. Interestingly, though, what we had done at one point, we were using propane heat in the winter. Um, and what was happening is it was sucking all the oxygen out and the plants were getting sick. So uh, uh, it's a more of an oxygen loss than anything. So now we just we have a, a fan that either comes on with the heat or comes on based on time and is always bringing in fresh air. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it goes, so we compost it on site and then it goes off into the community. Oh, so what do we do with our, do we have a use for our waste soil and what do we do with it? Um, 
If we want to put it back into our system, we need to thermophilically compost it at 55 to 65 degrees for several days, several times. Can't be done in our, in our situation. So we have two things that happen. We're right next door to a couple community gardeners, and they come and they take it away wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow load, or random bag, or random tote load. Um, and then some of the local farmers will come and take it and use it as a potting mix. Some folks have used it to build gardens elsewhere. Um, so yeah, that generally, generally, like we've got a big backlog right now, but that's going to go out very quick as spring comes on. Uh, so generally, th they can keep up with uh, the pace that we have. Yeah. Is that driven by regulation that you have to compost in that way to reuse it, or just your policy internally to say it's, it's our internal policy. So where that came from was we, we spent a day which there's, there's a cost to that. We rented a tractor and there was a cost to that. And then we brought in a load of horse manure and there was a cost to that. We made a wicked compost pile and it got nice and hot once. I'm like, what are we gonna do? Bring a tractor in to, 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 to turn this again? So we're, we're basically in downtown Vancouver is where we operate, right? So different if we were on land. Um, I took a sample, sent it to the lab, comes back positive for Listeria mono. You don't want Listeria mono in your system. So first thing I do, which is what you always do, is we test it again. Test it in the same six spots and another six spots. It came back negative for a, a benign Listeria species, but after that we're like, we just, we just can't do that. We can't put it into our system. It would be, it's cheaper for us to buy new soil than to actually compost it and put it into our system, uh, and it does get used elsewhere. So we, bring, we do about, uh, about 100 to 120 yards of soil a year we have to bring in.